All right. Welcome, everybody, to another webinar of the Danish Sound Cluster. My name is Pedro, your usual host, and today we have three great guests, uh, experts in the field of the topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about this, what the topic is, but then they will get into more detail because it's better time used with them talking than with me. Uh, so uh, the, the topic of the webinar is, is called Assessing Real-Life User Experience to Improve Hearing Technology. Uh, this is kind of a rephrasing to, to EMA, uh, which is an Ecological Momentary Assessment. And basically, it's, it's a, well, you, you, they will explain better, but it's a, it's a science that is used to assess the user habits uh, in hearing aids, but uh, I'll leave it to you. So today we have three special guests that are coming from WS Audiology, Obor University, and Ericsson. Uh, I'll start with Josephine coming from Ericsson, a uh, scientist. And then we have Nadia uh, coming from WS Audiology, a uh, research audiologist. And then we have Rodrigo at the end, who is an associate professor at Albert University. Uh, before they go, I want to just give you some little uh, clues about how this works. So in the bottom there, you have the Q&A section, which you can press and it will open a window for you to ask your questions. Um, so you can write them down and then we'll take them at the end of the session. So we'll have all the presentations and then after that, we'll do a, a general Q&A, we'll answer everything. And then if we run out of questions, I'm sure we have more things we can talk about. Uh, so that's the process. Uh, and then at the end, at the very end, we'll, you, when you finish the, the webinar or if you leave, uh, there will be a short survey, which would be really great if you can answer that survey for us to improve the webinars. So without further ado, I think we should just give uh, the space for Josephine to start and you can share the presentation when you like, Josephine. That's yes, thank go. you. Whoops. Good. Looks good. So, yeah, great. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Petro. Um, as you said, I'm Josephine and I'm a scientist at Ericsson Research Center, uh, which is Oticon's research group in Denmark. And uh, I have a PhD in hearing science from DTU and a master in electrical engineering. And I have been nerding um, the influence of hearing loss on human interaction for many years now. And in general, I'm just determined to create solutions that can help people communicate better. Um, so at Eric's Home, my primary focus right now is to find paddle, patterns in how people use their hearing aids out in the real world, uh, basically so that we can build products that can make listening and communication easier uh, for people with hearing loss. Um, and today I would like to show you data from a study that we've um, previous, uh, just completed. Uh, at Eric's home where we have investigated people's preferences for levels of uh, brightness and noise reduction in hearing aids in the real world. I did not do the study alone at all. Uh, I was part of a bigger team that I've mentioned by name in the upper left corner. So um, since I'm the first one to give a presentation in this series of EMA webinars, I will just briefly uh, introduce the concept of EMA uh, for you. So EMA stands for Ecologically Momentary Assessment. And what it is, is a repeated real-time assessment of subject behavior and or experiences evaluated while people find themselves in the situation they are evaluating. So basically people are sent out in the real world and are typically asked to evaluate their hearing experiences in everyday situations on a smartphone or some other electronic device and they are asked to do this repeatedly throughout a trial period. And this is contrasting to the way that we typically uh, let our test participants fill out questionnaires during a clinical visit where subjects have to recall their past experiences uh, in previous situations. 
And so EMA really has this advantage of uh, reducing memory bias, and it is also more sensitive to the context that people find themselves in. Um, so the concept is not new, it comes from psychology, and it has been adapted in hearing science many years ago, but right now it is, it is increasing in popularity, um, both because we are developing tools that makes it easier to capture these EMAs out in the real world uh, through, for example, app uh, applications, um, but also because our field is generally moving towards um, making measures of people's hearing experiences closer to what we experience in real life. Um, so you may can take one step closer to do that by assessing people's uh, experiences out in the real world uh, while they are occurring. And in an EMA, you can ask a variety of different questions, uh, for example, on people's hearing difficulty or their satisfaction with their hearing device. Um, but there's no standardized set of questions that we ask or standardized scales that we are evaluating these questions on. Um, but there is a working group that um, contains uh, scientists across different universities and um, companies that are currently working on standardizing these questionnaires. And right now they are working on a recommendation paper uh, on this topic. So we should all stay tuned uh, for that. Um, so why do we even care about EMA in hearing science? Um, we will hear a lot of different examples uh, on how EMA is used in our field today, uh, in this uh, set of presentations today, and also in the next uh, webinar. So um, instead, I will just highlight a few EMA visions if we look a little bit uh, further ahead. So first, we could use it as a clinical tool. So the current practice uh, when people are fitted with hearing aids is that people come in for an initial fitting and then they are sent out into the real world uh, during an acclimatization period. That's a tricky word to say. <laughs> but then they gather a bunch of experiences out in the real world, but we are not capturing any of those experiences. And then sometimes there is a follow-up session after this um, where the hearing aid can be adjusted. But this fitting uh, or this adjustment is highly dependent on the clinician to be able to interpret and translate the user's recollection of their previous experiences. So if we instead introduce a field trial after the initial fitting, where we can have people fill out EMAs out in the real world and simultaneously uh, sample the acoustical context that people find themselves in and also lock other biomarkers such as, for example, pulse to indicate uh, people's stress level in a certain situation, then we can try to map out people's auditory reality and experiences in uh, those situations. And if we could present this form in some aggregated form to the clinician, then they could use that as a more uh, informed discussion uh, to assess the user's needs that they could then adjust the hearing aids to. And then another vision is to try and update people's hearing aid settings on the fly. Um, so if we can learn in what situations people are struggling and what their preferences are for hearing aid processing strategies in those situations, then we can update the settings on their hearing aids to automatically optimize listening in those situations. But to do that, we need to understand the translation between people's subjective reports and the objective measures that we can capture in the scene. Because for such a system to work seamlessly, we cannot rely on subjective reports from EMA. One, because it's quite a burden on people to have to fill in these EMAs on a continuous basis. And two, because it's not a seamless adaption if we have to rely on user input. So we need to be able to measure these preferences uh, objectively. All right, so that was just a brief introduction to the subject. Uh, so now I will present the study that we have conducted recently uh, where we have investigated whether we can find these preferences for levels of brightness and noise reduction in hearing aids in the real world. Um, in this study, we have recruited 30 uh, adults with mild to moderate hearing loss. They've had an average age of 70 years, and you can see their autograms here on the right side. 
Um, all test participants were fitted with uh, Oricon More test hearing aids, and then they had a baseline program that was the same as what they had in the current fitting in the current hearing aids. Um, and then what we did was that we um, presented them or we gave them four different programs. So the first program was a program called Natural. So that was their default level of noise reduction and their default level of bright brightness. And then we had another program called Detail, which had their default level of noise reduction and then an extra uh, brightness. So that was a boost of four to six to be in the high frequencies. And then in the next um, program uh, that we call full, we had maximum noise reduction, but their default level of brightness. And then in the end, we had a, pro um, a program called Clarity that had maximum uh, noise reduction and uh, extra brightness. And then we randomized the order of these programs uh, so that the same program would not end up on P1 uh, for, for every test participant. Then people were sent out into the field um, uh, with an app, an Oricon On app. Um, and every two hours during daytime, we prompted them to fill out an email questionnaire. And what they were asked first was, overall, are you hearing things properly? And they were rating that on a scale from one to 10, from not at all to very much. Uh, in order to reduce the time that it took for people to fill in these EMAs, we chose to have a cut out of the uh, EMA protocol when people chose a rating higher than seven. So basically they were, at, uh, they were thanked for their participation in that EMA and they could close the app. But if they chose a rating lower than eight, then they were asked, uh, asked a second question, which was how satisfied are you with the performance of the hearing aid? Again, if they were very satisfied, uh, they could close the app. Otherwise, they would continue to elaborate on their environment, which could be that they are at home or at a restaurant, for example, and their current movement, like whether they are stationary or running uh, in transportation and so on, and what their intention in the situation is. So are they trying to follow a conversation or are they trying to focus or watch TV or whatever? And then um, when they were sent out to the field. What we were capturing was uh, whenever they made a program change in the app or on the hearing aid, whenever they made a volume change, uh, whenever they filled out an EMA questionnaire. And also we, uh, throughout the whole day, captured the acoustic context around them. So the sound pressure level, the uh, signal to noise uh, ratio and noise level. And then we also had an automatic classifier of these environment intent and motion labels. But the stuff that I will present today is only on the EMA questionnaire and on uh, the acoustic context. So let's look at some data. But first, before diving into EMA, I just want to uh, start out with our clinical outcome. So after at least uh, four weeks of being sent out into the field, people came back or our test participant came back for a follow-up visit. And during this follow-up visit, we asked them whether they wanted an update to their primary program. And 64% of our test participants chose to have an update. So that means that 36% chose to stay with their default level of noise reduction and brightness. 18% chose to have maximum brightness and, uh, or maximum noise reduction. And another 18% chose to have extra brightness. And then finally, 29% chose to have uh, the program with maximum noise reduction and extra brightness. And that also means that about uh, half of, the, that there was an equal split between how many people wanted more noise reduction and more brightness. And that is uh, interesting actually, because in the clinic, uh, when people are uh, fitted, they, they typically immediately express whether they have a preference towards brightness or not because brightness has this immediate effect on the output of the hearing aid. You can immediately hear a difference, whereas noise reduction only has an effect on the output of the hearing aid in certain situations when the acoustics are bad enough. Um, and maybe these situations are not well captured in a clinical setting, but then when people are sent home with their hearing aids and they have tried out the programs in a lot of different scenarios, 
they've probably tried them out in relevant situations where the acoustics have been bad enough for the noise reduction to kick in, and that might have uh, ended up giving them a preference towards these program, um, programs. And also, we have just encouraged people in general to try out different programs in different scenarios and evaluate them with EMA. So that might have increased their awareness of the program's effect in a certain situation, which could also um, impact their um, preference. So how are people scoring on these EMAs? Um, so this is now a histogram of the number of ratings done for each of the 10 uh, points on the hearing score scale uh, on the x-axis. Um, and it is clear that people tend to rate their hearing very high. So is that just because people are hearing great out in the world? Um, maybe not, <laughs> uh, maybe it is. But there may be several things going on here. Um, so the first um, thing that we should notice is what I told you before, that we had this cutoff that people did not have to elaborate more on their experiences when they chose a rating that was uh, above seven. Um, so we are speculating that some people might deliberately have chosen to use this upper end of the scale so that they didn't have to fill out more details. But the feedback that we got um, during the clinical uh, follow-up visit was actually, actually that some of the people chose deliberately to use a lower score because they wanted to elaborate on their current situation. So it's not clear how the data is biased, but in order to avoid that, we will uh, reconsider whether we should use this flow logic uh, in our next run of the project. But there's also just a general issue in that in EMA that people are using the upper end of the scale a lot. Um, and there could be a number of reasons for that. People might simply not find themselves in very difficult situations in their everyday life, um, maybe because they have learned to avoid those situations because they have to spend a lot of effort listening or communicating in those scenarios. But it could also be that people are trying to please the study conductor by giving very positive feedback. And it may also be that they are finding themselves in these tricky situations, but that they don't want to fill out an EMA during those tricky situations because it could be inappropriate to take up your phone during a conversation. Um, but uh, Nadja, who will present after me today, will um, have done a lot of great studies um, diving into all of these questions. So stay tuned for her presentation. But no matter the reason uh, for these high ratings, uh, it's important to capture the context in which people are filling out these EMAs in order, in order to better understand why they are rating it and uh, the way they are. Um, so now if we take those ratings and we divide it across the four programs that people have used out in the real world, um, then we get the following four histograms. So these are the ratings that were done when people were using the default program. These are the ratings that were uh, done when uh, people used the program with high brightness and with higher noise reduction and the program that had extra brightness and maximum noise reduction. So in general, it seems like the two programs that have, the, uh, that have high noise reduction or uh, maximum noise reduction um, have lower scores um, but is that because people do not prefer noise reduction? Uh, probably not, because 74% chose to actually update their primary program to one of the programs that have maximum noise reduction. Um, so let's try and div uh, divide it a little bit further. So now if we further divide these hearing scores by the program that people chose to update to after this trial period, we get this split. So again, the rows represent what program people are evaluated, uh, evaluating out in the field. And each column um, represents the program that people choose to update their primary program to after this trial period. So just to give an example here, if we look at the uh, rightmost column, we can see how the, the people who updated to the program that had maximum noise reduction and extra brightness are rating each of the programs out in the world. But it's not really easy to get a feeling of the data this way. So instead, I have plotted or I have colored each of the tiles by the average hearing score. 
for each of these programs. So the higher the score, uh, or the, higher, uh, the darker the color, the higher the score. So if people choose to update to the program that they gave the highest score, we would see a highlighted diagonal, but we do not. And that does not mean that people are not necessarily preferring this program in a certain situation, but it means that we cannot determine it from how high they are scoring these programs. But instead, if we are coloring the tiles by the number of EMAs that they have filled out for each of these programs, we do somewhat see this highlighted diagonal. So it seems that people are tending towards updating or having like a preference towards the program that they are giving the most uh, EMA ratings out in the real world. But if we want to get a step closer to understanding why people are choosing the program um, that they are after this trial period, we can inspect the acoustical context that people are finding themselves in um, during this trial period. So here I have plotted um, the SNR on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we have the four programs that people choose to update to. So here we can see that the people who choose extra brightness generally find themselves in higher SNRs. And that is not surprising because if you're in lower SNRs, you do not want to add more high frequency gain because you're just boosting the noise. So uh, brightness generally requires higher SNR. Um, I have also plotted the uh, sound pressure level in the middle and the noise level on the right side. And here we see that the people who choose to update to a program that have maximum noise reduction generally find themselves in um, environments that uh, are uh, louder and more noisy. That's also not surprising because you would think that people want uh, more noise reduction when there is more noise. But let's try and relate those acoustical contexts again back to how people are scoring the EMAs. Uh, so here I have plotted box plots of S and R's for each of the hearing scores on the x-axis. Um, the solid uh, gray dots here uh, represent outliers and the grayed out dots represent individual data. And we found that in general, the higher the S and R, the better the score. So that also makes sense. Uh, it should be easier to hear when there is a better S and R. And we found the inverse relationship for SPL and noise level, that the higher the noise level and the higher uh, the SPL, the lower the score. Um, there are a few outliers here for a hearing score of four, but it's driven by three points uh, or so. Um, so the, the overall relationship was still statistically significant. So I know that this was a lot of data <laughs> that I threw at you and there's a lot of like going back and forth and it's probably quite difficult to wrap your head around. Uh, so I'll just try to summarize what I just said. Um, that people who prefer noise reduction programs, which I mean by they update their primary program to noise, uh, a program that has maximum noise reduction in the end, they are generally in louder and more noisy environments and they also rate those programs more out in the field, which might be why we see general lower ratings for those programs. The point that I'm really trying to make here is that it is important to capture the other context parameters than just people's EMA ratings to be able to interpret these ratings. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so that was a lot, but I will try to wrap it up. Uh, in these few points. So we found that uh, it was quite difficult to use EMA ratings directly to say something about people's preferences for a certain program. But we did see that the majority of people chose to update to one of the three programs that we provided them which, with. Uh, so that suggests some kind of preference towards those programs. So it might be that because people were encouraged to try out programs in different scenarios, and evaluate their experiences, they had this increased awareness of their hearing experiences. And that might really be the, 
one stronger value of using EMA in field trials that you can increase people's awareness of their hearing in certain situations. So maybe it's not the rating themselves, but more the effect that it gives that you send people out to evaluate um, these different programs in the real world. Um, we also found that without capturing the acoustical context that people evaluated these programs in, it was quite difficult to say anything meaningful about these ratings. So again, it's important to capture the context in which people are evaluating the programs. Um, and we do believe that EMA can be used as this occasional feedback tool um, that can be useful in a clinical setting where people can report uh, on their experiences when they have something to say. So when they have something uh, they think that matters and not every two hours as we prompted them to do in, in this study. Because eventually we would like to arrive at a point where we understand the translation between subjective EMA reports and objective measures um, so that we can actually describe this um, um, or the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> But eventually we want to be able to not have to capture these EMA reports because we want to just be able to describe it uh, with objective measures only such as the acoustical context that people find themselves in or other biomarkers such as, for example, pulse to indicate uh, stress levels. Um, and if you want to hear more about how we are using these different senses, um, how we're integrating them into uh, EMA analysis, I will highly encourage you to listen to my colleague Jebe Hoy Christensen's talk uh, in the next uh, Danish Sound Cluster webinar that is in uh, two weeks from now. So that's it for me uh, now, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Josephine. That was really good. A lot of data, definitely, but yeah, very, sorry. <laughs> very valuable. I think it's better more than, than less, so you did well. <laughs> Sometimes. Awesome. Okay, but uh, then let's uh, keep going. And uh, Nadja, if you'd like, you can start sharing uh, your presentation and uh, whenever you want to go. Okay, my, my name is Nadja Schinkel Bielefeld. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I actually joined the hearing aid industry and WS audiology six years ago. And my first task actually was to make a concept for an EMA app because we wanted to evaluate our hearing aids. And since then, I've worked a lot on EMA and also the pitfalls you have in EMA and possible biases. And thank you very much to, to Josefine for giving an excellent introduction into my talk. Um, so as a hearing aid company, we are of course interested in evaluating our hearing aids. Um, and it's not good enough if they provide a benefit in some artificial laboratory experiment, they are supposed to provide a benefit in real life and we want to measure that in real life. So obviously ecological momentary assessment is a method of choice, but we very soon found similar problems as Josephine that we have uh, ceiling effects. And um, here is, for example, an, an example of one of the previous studies, but we have also seen at, at Josephine's talk that there are very high ratings. And the question is, why is that? Are our hearing aids really that good? Or are participants too reluctant to give poor ratings because they like us and want to be nice? It could also be because we primarily do studies um, with experienced hearing aid wearers. So maybe we exclude the ones who are having trouble getting used to hearing aids. But I guess we will later hear more from a study with real patients from uh, Rodrigo. Then it could be that participants skip questionnaires in challenging situations. If I'm already uh, struggling to understand, maybe that's not the best time to get out my phone and fill out a questionnaire. Or it could be that they are either avoiding or modifying difficult situations. For example, if you could not understand what I'm saying, you would probably not just stick around, you would try to do something about it. Maybe restart the computer or use a different technology 
And if nothing helps, you probably would not stay here for a 90 minute webinar, uh, but you would rather do something more useful and maybe watch the recording afterwards. So today I would like to focus on two of those questions. Are participants reluctant to give poor ratings? So we are comparing laboratory experiments with field trials and are participants avoiding or modifying difficult situations? So we did the study where we had the same questions out in the field and in the laboratory. And for that, we had 17 uh, participants with moderate to severe hearing loss. They had three days of acclimatization and then there was a two week EMA uh, field trial. They had nine prompts at random times and if they were in speech situations, there could be up to four more prompts specifically in speech situations. And we captured the SNR continuously through the hearing aids. Um, in, the, in the laboratory, we did an SNR test where we presented uh, speech and noise at various SNRs. Speech was always presented from the frontal speaker um, and noise from the speakers around, and we had SNRs between minus 10 dB and 20 dB. There was a female and a male speaker, and we had two different kinds of noises, canteen noise and traffic noise. Furthermore, we wanted to know what noise levels are acceptable to our participants. So we did an acceptable noise level test uh, developed by Nabelek and colleagues, where participants first chose the most comfortable level for the speech signal to listen to. They first adjusted the speech to a too loud level, then to a too soft level, and then to the correct level, uh, an, an up, a comfortable level. And then the noise was added, and again, they first adjusted the noise to a very high level. And because we were interested in avoidance, we also asked them to specifically adjust it to a volume uh, where they would leave a conversation. Then they adjusted it to a very soft level and then to a level where they can listen for a long time. Um, then you can compute the acceptable noise level, which is the most comfortable level minus the best noise level. level. And because we were interested in avoidance, we defined the unacceptable noise level which is this high noise level where people would abort a conversation. It is the most comfortable level minus this high noise level where people would abort a conversation. We had the same noise as in the SNR test. And because in real life, you cannot always influence the level of the target speaker. We also repeated the test with a fixed speech level of 65 dB. And here you can see uh, the results from the field file. And we surely have a ceiling effect uh, as well. Here for hearing aid satisfaction, the red bars are non-speech situations, the blue bars are speech situations. For speech understanding and li listening effort, we only asked in speech situation. And for speech understanding, you can see that 70% of all ratings are a nine or a 10 out of a 10 point scale. Um, similar for satisfaction, there are very few ratings below neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. And we really tried to find a label which was as close as possible to the best imaginable. Um, so we came up with completely satisfied and in a third of all situations, they were completely satisfied. Listening effort was spread out a bit more. Um, only extreme effort and high effort are, are very rare. However, if we compare this with the ratings in the laboratory, you can see that the whole rating scale was used. So the different colors here are different speakers and different noise, uh, different kinds of noise, but the whole uh, rating scale is used if you go down to minus SNR of minus 10. And then we wanted to know how is the acceptable noise level weighted? So for each individual, we looked what was their acceptable noise level uh, how did they weight the SNR and the SNR test? And you can see that the acceptable noise level is still weighted with very satisfied. And even the unacceptable noise level, meaning the level where people would leave a conversation, is still around neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. So if here people already leave the situation, then maybe it is not surprising that they don't use the upper, the lower end of the scale. 
it's even more uh, pronounced for speech understanding. There the unacceptable noise level is between six and seven. So the complete lower part of the scale uh, is basically not used because they are already leaving a conversation here. Um, then we wanted to know uh, how often are people in real life in SNRs below the acceptable noise level, and that's about a quarter. And about 10% of the time they are below the unacceptable noise level. And the question is, why is that? Does the world just happen to be like that? Um, or is it that we can shape our environment? Uh, and if we can shape our environment, you would expect that there is a correlation between the unacceptable noise level of individuals and the SNR they experience. And we did not find this correlation for the acceptable noise level. However, we did see this correlation for the unacceptable noise level. Here we correlated with the fifth percentile of the SNR. Um, and we found a moderate correlation, which is borderline significant. We did discard three participants because they misunderstood the instructions in the acceptable noise level test. There you have to adjust the, the volume first to high, then to low, and then just right. And these three participants did not show this pattern at all. Um, so we do have a correlation between people's noise preference and what they experience in real life. And that is consistent with our hypothesis that they shape their environment and maybe modify dissatisfactory situations. But of course, it's not a proof. It could equally well be that what we experience day to day shapes our noise preference. For example, many people report that during the pandemic, they have not been in noisy situations very much. And as a result, they became more sensitive to noise. So we did another study where we really wanted to look at this modification uh, behavior. And by, by the way, are you still seeing my, the, the pictures on top of my slides? Yes. Why didn't been... anyone say anything? It looks what? good. It's good, okay. No, we, we, we just see your presentation. It's all good. Okay. Don't see any it pictures just keeps going, yes. <laughs> Okay. Now you only have the one on the left, right? The picture on the left there's only one picture on the left side or, I, I mean uh, i see your your pictures on top of my slides rather than no no that's just your view no one else sees that okay yes sorry for that so no the problem. second study we really wanted to look at what modifications do people in their day to everyday life um and so what are modifications it's basically every action that results in a more pleasing listening situation it could be that you increase the volume of the TV or the radio so you understand it better. It could be if it's noisy outside that you close the door or the window. Uh, or it could be if you're in a conversation that you ask your conversation partner to speak up um, or you go closer to your conversation partner to increase the SNR. For hearing aid wearers, it could of course also be changing the volume of the hearing aid or switching off the hearing aid or the extreme case would then be to leave the situation completely uh, or to continue the conversation elsewhere. Um, and we did a study where we asked participants to report those situations where they modified the uh, acoustic situation. We had 29 experienced hearing aid wearers. It was a remote study. In the first uh, video call, there was a fine tuning of the hearing aids. And we did some brainstorming with the participants, which situations they modify in their real life or would wish to modify. And those we then also used for training questionnaires in the EMA app. Um, we also did a questionnaire on how often they experience uh, most common modifications. And then we sent them out with the EMA app for three weeks. And the instruction was whenever you encounter a situation which you either modify to improve the listening situation or you would have liked to modify, please fill out a questionnaire. And because we wanted to know whether modification differ between different programs, we gave them two hearing programs, one with a lot of directionality and noise reduction, 
and one which was omnidirectional and had very little noise reduction. And here are some results. We got uh, 2.3 uh, questionnaires per day. In 79% of those modifications were performed immediately. Um, in the remaining case, it, is, it was usually performed within five to 10 minutes. And we also asked participants how they weighed the pleasantness um, of the hearing situation before the modification and after the modification. So you can see the cyan colored bars and the white ones. This are, these are the weightings before the modification and they are clearly skewed towards negative weightings. And the pink colored bars are the weightings after the modification. So they are skewed towards positive weightings. A little bit similar to, to the ceiling effect we see in the weightings of many other studies. So there is a significant difference you can make by modifying your acoustic environment. We also looked at the two different uh, hearing programs. And you can see that there was a significant difference for changing head and body positions. They did this significantly more frequently for the high directionality program, which makes total sense. If I'm amplifying the sound from the front, then it helps me a lot more if I change my head or body position than if I have an omnidirectional program. We also have a significant difference for increasing the hearing aid volume, which also makes sense um, because if I have very little noise reduction, increasing the volume won't help me much because it increases the noise with the target signal. Generally, so, so the responses were first uh, classified into a broader category. They first said whether they, makes the target signal louder, the background softer, changes in the hearing aid or leaves the situation. And if we take all the modifications within making the target signal louder together, this was also more frequent for the high directionality program than for the low directionality program. We did not see significant differences for the reports of switching of hearing aids, but there must have been a significant difference because we have seen that the a uh, high directional program was worn 1.4 hours longer per day uh, than the low directionality program. So they, they really behave differently with one program compared to the other. So you may ask, okay, why is that a problem if they behave differently in the two programs? And I would like to invite you to a little thought experiment. Imagine we have two hearing aids, both are great for speech and quiet. And for speech and noise, one hearing aid is okay, and the other one is really bad. Our participants first uh, test the first hearing aid. During the week, the participant watches a lot of TV, gives it five star ratings because it's speech and quiet. At the weekend, he goes to a party. The hearing aid is okay, but he's having a great time. In the second week, again, during the week, a lot of TV and five star ratings. And then comes the weekend he has been looking forward to all week and he goes to the party. But the hearing aids are so bad that he has a really hard time understanding and after an hour he finds an excuse to leave the party. And unfortunately there was no random trigger in this one hour where he was at the party. The random trigger comes when he's back home watching TV. And he still said that he is not at the party but the EMA app only asks him how well he understands. And of course, he understands the TV very well because it's speech and quiet, so he gives it a five star rating. The next evening, originally he was planning to go to a party, but he decides to skip it because he doesn't understand with his hearing ads. Instead, we have again TV and a five star rating. Then comes the researcher and counts the ratings, and we have a clear winner. The hearing ad, which by definition was worse, has a better ratings than the hearing aid, which was better. So avoidance uh, behavior can really change the rank order. So that could be one of the reasons why Josefine was not seeing that the most preferred hearing programs were rated the best. This is of course a very extreme example, but even if it's not that extreme, if I'm just becoming tired a little bit earlier and leaving the party a little bit earlier, or if I have to increase my, the volume of my TV a little bit more, 
um, it reduces the sensitivity of EMA when we want to compare uh, to, to programs or to, to technologies because we, we partially account for it by just behaving differently. So to sum up what we learned from these two studies, the entire weighting scale was used in the SNR test, but not in the field trial. So it's very unlikely that people are simply reluctant to use the full scale. The unacceptable noise level, meaning the level where people would leave a conversation, was still weighted well above the end of the weighting scale. So it's very possible that avoidance is the reason that we get so few poor weightings. SNRs, which were weighted poorly in the laboratory, are rare in real life. So possibly uh, we need different weighting scales uh, for real life evaluations because these really poor weightings uh, you find in the laboratory are just not applicable in real life. In laboratory, you can make people suffer through negative SNRs and maybe they are frustrated, but they know it just belongs to the test in real life. They probably just wouldn't stay in that situation. And we have seen correlations between the unacceptable noise level and the SNR experienced in real life. Um, so there is some kind of relation, but we don't know whether that's really confirming our hypothesis or whether it's the other way around. We have seen that participants modify the acoustic environment several times per day, and that these modifications clearly improve the pleasantness of the situation and that this modification can differ between hearing programs. And this could lead to a reduced sensitivity when we are comparing different technologies and also to an overestimation of the benefit of those technologies. So where are we going from here? If difficult situations are quickly modified and not reported in EMA, then maybe we should ask about the immediate past. And so we wanted to do a short-term retrospective, asking participants about the most difficult situation in the last 30 minutes and to wait those. So we would also get the situations which are quickly modified. And also we would ask participants about the modification and whether there is a cost attached to it. If I can simply increase the volume of the TV and I'm watching alone, then that doesn't bother me. If I'm in a really important conversation and I have to keep asking people to speak up, then that could be very embarrassing. So there clearly is the cost attached to this. And our hypothesis are that A, the short-term retrospective will be more sensitive than a purely momentary assessment. And B, that taking into account the cost of those modifications may increase the sensitivity. And the study will be conducted together with the yeah, the University of Applied Sciences in Oldenburg. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators. Um, the first study was the master thesis of Jana Rietzlev, co-supervised by Dina Lelic. The avoidance study was the bachelor thesis of Iris Borschke, co-supervised by Tim Jürgens. The EMA app was programmed by Bastian Buda, and then there were several teams taking care of it uh, through the years and Beresh Rudresh provided an analysis tool for the EMA GUI. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. I got a couple of complaints that my microphone was distorting, so I tried to change it. I hope you still can hear me well. Uh, not so much? All right. I'll put it a little louder. But meanwhile, maybe Rodrigo, you can just uh, share your screen. Yes. Um, How about now? Is it better? Yeah, it, it, it seems to be a bit better. Okay. It's because if I crank it all the way up, then I'll get this distortion. But, uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. And, uh, you're free to go. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you uh, to Danny Soundcluster for this invitation. Um, and uh, thank you to Nadia and Josefini for very, very good presentations. There's a lot to talk about here, I guess. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, a study that we conducted within the Better uh, Hearing Rehabilitation Framework or the BEAR project as is uh, better known to those who have participated in it. Um, 
Uh, and what we did in it was uh, uh, to try to probe uh, hearing aid user experiences. And I'll try to tell you how we, how we did this. So um, first, very briefly about the project itself. Um, the project was uh, uh, an, uh, a project funded by the Innovation Fund and, uh, and uh, supported also by, by industry. And it involved uh, uh, both uh, clinics uh, here in Denmark, uh, uh, Oticon, GN Resound, Wydes, Sivantos Audiology, and Force uh, from the industry, and uh, uh, three of uh, the universities here in Denmark. So it was a very uh, broad uh, collaboration that involved uh, most of the relevant people within, within a hearing aid uh, fitting and, and uh, development. The main vision and idea of the project is to improve the re re rehabilitation, the hearing rehabilitation in Denmark and anywhere else uh, through evidence-based innovation of clinical guided guidelines and policies. So the idea is that currently we uh, use an audiogram to, to, to fit our, our, our our patients and uh, through that uh, a hearing aid fitting and after uh, through a trial and error process try to adjust uh, uh, the problems and the idea was here to try to uh, uh, have a greater amount of, of, uh, of assessment or, or try to profile the hearing loss uh, more detailedly make a better uh, starting point uh, with the hearing fitting and then uh, based on that on the data collected try to get a more uh, 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 improve the, the performance. Uh, the, the project was uh, divided in many steps, so here are four of them. And, and uh, what we did was basically applied during the, the fourth uh, step or work package four, which was the validation of the new strategy. Um, so what is experience sampling? Uh, experience uh, with hearing aids are very individual as, as uh, we've heard so far. Uh, it can be very difficult uh, for hearing aid users to communicate uh, their experiences, and uh, it can be very difficult for hearing aid users to know which experiences are important uh, for the readjustment process. So that's uh, one of our one of the, the the issues for trying to 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 assess experience uh, in in an ecological manner. Um, there's generally also a lot of time between fitting and follow up, so approximately two months, and there's a strong dependency in memory from, from, from whatever feedback a user can give to the, to the hearing aid provider. Um, so in terms of uh, assessment the experiences, uh, any system used for this should be simple to use, uh, should be accessible from multiple platforms. So that means that we should try to make, make it a, as accessible as possible for users. Uh, it should uh, uh, be able to be incorporated in, in a daily uh, use scenario so people could use it every day, hopefully. Um, and our, our approach to this was try to avoid judgment uh, or evaluation. Uh, a little bit of what uh, Nadia and Josefina have been talking about, these ceiling effects in scales or how do people judge uh, different situations uh, are very context dependent. So our approach was to rather than, than, than try to gather judgments, we would try to just uh, uh, um, register the amount of positive or negative experience uh, subjects uh, or, or patients uh, would, would experience. So it's more a quantitative rather than a qualitative anal analysis of, of, of data that we're trying to gather. So, uh, and the idea is basically is if this uh, assessment is done uh, uh, in a regular basis, then the the, the 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 assessment of of which experience I, I've I've uh, I've had will be based on on a relatively short time so so it'll be something that is is relatively fresh in my mind or in the patient's mind in this case so uh, our approach to this was try to develop a, a, a web application uh, that you can see here in the screen that it was called the Habo system so her apparat or uh, in Danish. Uh, so hearing aid, a user experience. Uh, and it, uh, Habo sounds nice, so, so that's why we kept it actually. So uh, as we can see from, from, from this interface, which is a very simple interface in which the, 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 the patients would uh, be shown a sentence. Uh, in this case, uh, when there was noise, my tinnitus uh, got louder. So 
the, the interaction possibilities for the patient are basically to say, I've experienced that or I have not experienced that. Say, is this relevant for me or not relevant for me, sorry? Or go one, one screen back to judge uh, or to, to retake uh, the, the last uh, uh, answered question. So it was, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. And the idea was not to make them judge in a scale, not to say how much my tinnitus increased or how loud this noise was, but basically I had that experience or I didn't have that experience. So, so the assessment for the subject, uh, for the patient, sorry, is as simple as possible. You have to try to remember if you've experienced this since the last time you were asked this question. So in order to arrive at this experience, uh, which uh, ended up being 564 user experience atoms, as we call them, divided in 13 categories. To do this, we, we, uh, we took a participatory uh, design approach in which uh, hearing aid users, audiologists, and engineers all participated in developing these uh, user stories. We, we did this through uh, a series of observations in, uh, in the three clinics that were participating in the BEAR, Bear project, uh, where we observed both uh, the diagnosis process, both the initial fitting and a follow-up session or different follow-up sessions in uh, using a contextual inquiry approach. So basically we observed the interaction and, and uh, prompted questions when, whenever uh, felt uh, necessary. Additional interviews were conducted with both hearing aid uh, users and, and audiologists. And all of this data was transcribed and used uh, in, uh, in workshops to develop these user atoms. So basically the data was, was, uh, was uh, atomized or made into sentences that, that described a, an experience. And, and from there, we, we uh, worked through all the material we had in order to, to come up with with 564 experiences that were plausible for hearing aid users to have. And we also uh, uh, manipulated them. So we had a negative and a positive version. So for example, uh, we would have here, uh, an example is I, I have used, uh, yeah, uh, I needed to turn off my hearing aid because it, uh, it became too much. Uh, the, uh, the sound became too much or a, 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 an accompanying sentence or, or the positive sentence would, would be that I didn't have to uh, turn off my hearing aid, even though there was a lot, a lot of sound. Another example is, uh, for example, I heard a knieted and a knieted, I can't translate that. A knieted, I heard like noise uh, when I uh, um, held a, uh, when I uh, poured a, a, a fizzy drink or a soda or a beer, depends on what he was pouring. That's the difference, what he heard uh, in a glass. Or another example would be, I, can, I could hear uh, the voices. Uh, I, yeah, I, could hear, I, could, I could hear from the voices that the person was happy. So these, these sentences more than try to ev uh, ask the people to judge in a scale or to try to evaluate the content of the sentence, you're asked to, to report back if you had this experience or not. So the idea is that through these experience, both negative and positive, we want to see if within a certain uh, area of interest, the, the person has reported uh, either good experiences or bad experiences. The 564 um, uh, expressions or, or atoms that we div devised uh, were, were div uh, divided in 13 categories uh, that we can see in this graph. So uh, most importantly, speech, of course, uh, most of the, uh, a lot of the questions around 84 questions were basically uh, around uh, understanding speech and hearing uh, speech, and then the different uh, categories of interest. So everything from how the hearing aid fits in the ear, how much do you use it? Uh, do you have a support network or people that can help you around with the hearing aid use? Uh, there were some question, questions uh, regarding tinnitus or experiences regarding tinnitus uh, um, about uh, energy and working memory, noise annoyance and so forth. So all of these categories included different experiences that try to reflect how, how people would, would uh, perceive sound in, in different uh, scenarios. 
Uh, and all of the data was taken either, all, all of these experiences were derived either from, from the contextual inquiry, the interviews, or from, from existing uh, 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 questionnaires. So for example, the, the, the tinnitus inventory was taken care, uh, was taken into account when de de devising uh, tinnitus uh, uh, experiences, as well as the, the IO, IOIH or the hearing aid inventory. Yeah, you know, the typical questionnaires used uh, uh, for this purpose. Uh, the implementation of the system well, was a web page uh, that uh, was made accessible from uh, multiple platforms. So basically, we have a, a, a web server which uh, which has uh, stored all the experiences uh, that we that we devised or the uh, user atoms, uh, uh, individualized presentation orders for every respondent, and uh, holds uh, stores all the responses that 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 were made. And uh, this is uh, the, the the server is hosting an Apache uh, web server, which is basically uh, giving access to all different devices. We we tried to as much as possible to do a responsive device, so 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 the interface is more or less the same, no matter if you use a telephone or 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 a large screen. Of course, he has some some limitations with very large screens. Uh, users uh, authenticated themselves through uh, uh, an ID and a password, and each re responded uh, would iterate through the 564 atoms, and they would be presented in different orders. So, so after you went through 564 atoms, the next uh, round of, of 564 would be would be uh, uh, randomized. So, so it wouldn't be the same order. Uh, all respondents. Uh, uh, and time, uh, all responses and time of for, for each response was saved in the server. So that means that every time a subject pressed either I experienced or not experienced, or, or I am, uh, uh, this is irrelevant for me, that was registered in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a file for that participant. So we have basically information of when the person interacted with the system, how many of the questions did they answer in a row, for example, or how many days did they answer and everything. Um, the respondents could stop and start uh, 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 the interaction with the system at any time. And uh, the system was programmed using a very uh, common uh, web uh, uh, technologies. And um, all data was uh, anonymized and saved in a, in a server, uh, secure server in the university. In terms of the deployment, when did we uh, deploy this uh, this user experience assessment? Was basically uh, during uh, work package four or the validation uh, of the new strategy of, of the Bear project. Subjects or, or patients were invited uh, to the first visit where they will check for eligibility to participate in the experiment, uh, the medical assessment and the, and, the, and the hearing assessment will be done. If the people were enrolled in the experiment in the next visit, then the extended clinical test battery was done where additional uh, assessment of the hearing was made. And, uh, and uh, uh, for the third visit, they would come for uh, the actual fitting, and they, they would replace either in, 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 in the arm of the, of the, of the of the test with uh, using the current strategy or the bare feeding strategy, and and they would participate in an aided oh sorry in a aided test battery, which basically uh, served as as a measure of, of of performance of the hearing aid by by having them uh, uh, do some some listening in the clinic uh, using the hearing aids. Uh, from that point on, they were uh, given access to the to the Hubble system, so they could, uh, for the next two months, use the Hubble system, and and then uh, uh, come back for the fourth visit for the follow up, where they would uh, go through uh, uh, the remaining part of the test. We did not include actively uh, feedback from the Hubble system on on the fourth uh, visit because we didn't want to. Uh, 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 Contaminate the main uh, the main uh, uh, variable of the experiment, which was the the REM fitting. So so we only uh, gave access to the system. Uh, people could respond and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and use the, the system, but we did not follow up with the subject with the patients uh, their responses. So neither patients patients nor audiologists actually 
saw the responses uh, uh, they gathered. So, so it's basically it was basically just for me. So I can uh, uh, use time making MATLAB figures. Then you guys have to tell me if I've wasted my time or not. Okay, so uh, after this uh, this process, um, the data that we gathered at the end were data from 140 patients uh, that participated in the in the validation experiment. Uh, we gathered a total of uh, 96,033 experiences, and uh, engagement with the system was a very very individual. That means that some people uh, used the system very actively, while other people were were, were actually very uh, sporadic uh, in use. So I'll show you some data now so, so you can understand what I'm talking about. And uh, I'll spend more time in this first figure so you understand what the figure is, and then uh, I'll go quickly through, through the other data. So first, what we see in this side of the figure is uh, a timeline. So from the 11th of February to approximately the 8th of April. So each one of these uh, spaces is approximately a week. So we have two weeks here, two weeks here, two weeks here, and then the final two weeks. So this is about two month period. And, and the idea is that, uh, that uh, people used, in this case, this person answered almost every day, day in the first two weeks, uh, 30 experiences, and then less so in the following two weeks and, and so forth. So, so what we can see in this side is a, is a timeline of the amount of answers. The colors represent the positive and the negative experiences, uh, and the gray bars represent experiences that they were the subjects either didn't have or they deemed irrelevant. And on this uh, uh, right side, what we see here is uh, uh, the bars. Uh, again, it's the same bars, the same colors as, as in this side, but here we see the the negative and the positive uh, for each of these categories. So speech, spatial, quality, and the, the different categories that we that we uh, devised the atoms for. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the circle in the middle shows the statistical probability of, of uh, uh, this distribution being uh, mostly positive or negative. This is basically taken as, as a binomial distribution where we have the amount of positive experience uh, over the total amount of experiences. So in this case, for example, the, the subject uh, in, the, in terms of speech, the person uh, answered 163 experiences related to speech. Out of those, 61 were positive and 67 were experienced, either positive or negative. So the person uh, had 61 positive experiences and six negative experiences. So this gives a high probability or more than 86% of probability of this being a, a positive uh, uh, outcome for this patient. So this is how we can read the, these graphs here on, on the left side. They're, they're very noisy. They have a lot of, uh, of, of numbers around it, but I hope that is understandable. So this, for example, was a subject or a patient, sorry, that, that actually used uh, 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 the system as we kind of devise it meaning that the, the person engaged with the system either on a daily basis or at least uh, uh, several times a week. Um, and we can see that most of the categories that we, that we looked into, the person has statistically positive experience or, or statistically significantly positive experiences. If we look uh, at another person who had a similar way of, of answering, we can see, for example, that uh, this person has no problem with tinnitus, apparently here. And most of the categories also show uh, a reasonable uh, uh, acceptance to, to, to the hearing aid. And we can go on uh, looking at data. You can see that the, the way people use it is much different. If we compare this subject with the next one, we can see that the, this person actually uses uh, the engages uh, a minimum of uh, uh, answers thirty experiences and then stops, while uh, while the other person here in the beginning used the system much more and then uh, gradually less. So this is what we would expect minimum engagement during these two months to be able to have information to use 
uh, actually to help uh, 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 the, the, the audiologist. In this case, for example, we can see clearly that the person has some challenges in terms of using the hearing aid, or uh, uh, that the person is actually very satisfied with, with uh, the, percep the spatial perception of the hearing aid. So, so in most cases, we can see that the, the, in this, in this uh, subject, for example, the, the, the ratings are relatively good, but we could see that there's, there might be issues in terms of the fitting or, or the amount of time the, the, the subject uses the, the hearing aid or as well uh, on, on, on uh, when, when the, the hearing aid has been used uh, in noise or, or when there is a noisy environment. So, so there is some some uh, some kind of indication of where we should uh, we should uh, start looking. Uh, on the other hand, if we get people that don't engage with the system at all, then it's very hard uh, uh, to do to say anything about them. We can see that the person maybe used it three times during the first two weeks and then once just before the follow up. This person was was probably feeling bad that he was told to do something and didn't do it just before he had to meet the audiologist. See, this is an example of somebody trying to study for a test the day before. Um, and then we can see also here as well, very little responses with time and other, other subjects that, or, or patients that actually uh, uh, engaged the system uh, rather much in the beginning, but, but then just uh, didn't care about it later. Uh, here's another example of, of rather sporadic engagement, but, but uh, each time for, for a long time. And here also another example. Here we can see that, that uh, there's a rather negative uh, uh, rating of the hearing aid in terms of noise, loud, loudness, the use, uh, it's having problem with tinnitus as well. And, and, uh, and uh, it, it appears to be in the beginning of, 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 the, of, the, of the measurement period. So the first two weeks period probably is responsible for most of these negative uh, judgments. And of course, here's another person that suddenly out of nowhere thought, oh, I have to do this and then spent two days uh, not answering back and forth. So, so it will probably be uh, uh, there. The, if, 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 if a subject uses uses the, the, the system in this way, then the ratings that we see in these two days are probably not representative of the entire month or two months. So, so this is actually just to say that this wouldn't be a very, uh, uh, a very good data set or, or you would have to actually be very careful in the interpretation of these, uh, of these results. So, um, what does the method probe? Uh, well, uh, if the patient engages with the system daily, then we have uh, we can quantify both positive and neg negative experience. So, so we have an idea of how many times the person had positive and negative experiences. And by knowing which ones they they designed, uh, they they said they experienced, then we can have an idea of the context in which this experience took place. Not knowing all the details, as with the with the sound uh, sound measurements, uh, like Josephine was telling, or or other contextual uh, context for for the given uh, assessment, but we have an idea. Uh, if the patient only uses the system sporadically, then the results will cover a large period, and this would be more more similar to to giving them a questionnaire and having them tick off answers, where they would basically try to 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 pull in uh, their experience from several months, and that's not the ideal use of this. How can we support the hearing care, uh, uh, hearing care professional? Well, uh, if this data is made available to the hearing uh, care professional as is being uh, collected, then then the then the, sub, the the hearing care professional can can check up on on different subjects, uh, different patients as needed, uh, and the information can be used to steer the dialogue to specific uh, uh, topics of interest. And it can be uh, can be used to reach out to the patient if if uh, if the data suddenly shows shows problems and and uh, and to get an idea of this uh, we can see in this uh, in this graph this is data from one of the subjects and each each of these columns here represents a day we can see there's a there's a date up here 
and and uh, of course uh, green means uh, good red means bad so so the idea is that uh, we can click on uh, one of these uh, uh, days and then for a given day we can see what experiences were good what experiences were bad and which ones were not were not experienced so so this this would be basically a tool for the audiologist to say, okay, I can see that this and this day you had a certain problem relating to this or this aspect of the hearing aid. Let's talk about that situation. What happened there? Can you remember what happened on this and this day? So, so we have the, the advantage of collating data, data like this is that we could know exactly when the person was uh, did this judgment. And then hopefully we can see how far back uh, uh, the person is 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 uh, considering this this effect for, and another uh, way of looking at this would basically be by uh, uh, plotting the data like this, but in a more active way, where we could see, for example, what happens the first two weeks. So we can see here are the ratings and the data for the first two weeks, for the next two weeks, and so forth. So the idea would be that 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 we are able to follow. If if there's a, a a change or or uh, evolution or on the way the subject is is reporting uh, the experiences, so we can we can have a, a conversation a, a spe specific conversation about the effects. So that's kind of like the idea uh, that would be nice uh, uh, to use this data for. And again, if the data is visible. Uh, to both the patient and the hearing care provider, uh, then uh, this could help develop a common understanding of the challenges. So, so if I can read that the person having the hearing aid is having trouble or experiences these bad experiences or these good experiences, then I can actually have a dialogue with them about it using the same language. Um, and then uh, this can help uh, the hearing care, care provider choose adjustments based on clear needs that the patient uh, indicates and help the patient understand the settings and challenges uh, and changes that are made on the hearing aid. So, so when, when, uh, when I'm, I'm complaining about, okay, this is when I go out on the street and then everything is overwhelming for me, then, then the, the, the hearing aid pro uh, care provider can explain why the setting changes will, will help me cope with that situation. So uh, to finish, my this is my, my take on what this could help. On the left side here, we can see that the, the audiologist uh, asks very broadly to the hearing aid patient, hearing aid patient uh, what has happened in the last two months. And the hearing aid uh, patient, well, he's not really sure what's important. What can he say and not say? To the to the hearing aid care, care provider because he might not have he or she might not have the language necessary to actually explain the problems that they had. Uh, on the other hand, if they both actively use these uh, this data, then the hearing aid provider can actually ask or the hearing care provider can ask direct questions into what parts of the experience were 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 problematic, and the and the hearing patient or the hearing aid patient can actually also uh, indicate uh, specifically what problems they they they, uh, they encounter and successes i think one of the things that we are actually not so focused here is what things are actually good experiences uh, both both uh, nadia and josefina in this in this uh, uh, try to find out when things don't work but i think uh, in terms of the of the of the the hearing rehabilitation is just as important to find out what works, right? Because, because we might uh, think that, oh, a bit more this, a bit more this here and there will change for what I think uh, the experience should be. But, uh, but we should be able to rely on, on what people think, well, this is great, don't mess with it. You know, I like the way things are going here or this is actually an empowering experience for me. So, so we need to uh, uh, keep that in mind. And not only try to fix problems, but also uh, acknowledge when things uh, are going well, both for our sake and the sake of the subjects. Sorry, patients, keep messing that up. Well, what are the next steps? Well, I still have a lot of data analysis to do. 
uh, which I owe many of my uh, great colleagues of, from the Bear Project. So sorry for that. Um, so we have to compare Hubble results with the feeding uh, targets used in the Bear uh, in the Bear Work Package Four data. Uh, compare Hubble results with other outcome measurements for, from from the Bear uh, uh, Project. Um, we need to do a revision of the list of experiences and uh, see maybe if we can customize it or, or uh, individualize it for a uh, type of uh, hearing aid, a uh, type of hearing loss, brand maybe, or, or, or even uh, patient segments. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, implement uh, the system, uh, having the active participation of hearing care provider so that uh, we can actually provide both feedback during the, 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 the acclimatization phase, but also uh, so that, uh, that we can uh, develop the tools that the hearing aid providers will need in order to, to, to use this data. Because the, the things I've showed you is basically how I can best visualize data. I don't know if that's what hearing aid providers will need in order to, 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 to improve uh, uh, the fitting. Yes, uh, I hope I didn't speak for too long, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rodrigo. That was great. Thank you to everybody. Everybody was uh, really good at it. And clearly, you know very well about EMA. And, uh, um, so uh, we don't have that many questions. I hope that sometimes people uh, start writing questions at the final minutes. But we have one. Uh, I think it's for you, Josephine. Uh, so if you want to unmute, did the participants leave the initial feeling at 100% acclimatization where their hearing aids match the targets with our uh, REM? And I'm bringing in the two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Go so ahead. Th uh, thank you. So uh, thanks for this good uh, question. Uh, yes, um, the participants, they were um, already experienced uh, hearing aid uh, users. So they had been through all the acclimatization uh, previously. And, um, and they had actually also been uh, through a lot of uh, fine tuning because uh, some of them have had hearing aids for many, many years. So they are, uh, they might be further away from this uh, scheme with a uh, uh, real emissions verification of a, a certain uh, rationale. So although that makes a very, very good sense if you want to uh, have a starting point uh, as the initial fit, uh, which uh, Josefine also uh, talked about, for this exact group, uh, it's, it's, it's less of an issue. So no, uh, they were not necessarily uh, followed up with the uh, REM measures uh, because they had had a lot of uh, fine tuning, so uh, so that's the status on where uh, where we are with uh, with those. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay, we got two more questions now. So, okay, it's uh, thank you from Joanna. And then, did we have patients with dead regions? Have you checked? I don't know for who this is for, but I would assume for everybody, maybe. I don't think we had. No, um, we don't, no, yeah. no. We haven't either. Okay, so it's a straight no from everyone. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, I mean, before we get any new questions, do you guys have questions to each other? Because you clearly, you know, it, it, to me, it seems like everybody has a very different approach. Uh, and, and clearly, I don't know, is there any standardization in, in, in this field or is there a need for standardization? I mean, that, that's what I get a bit confused about. I think that we are still pretty much in the early phases of using EMA in audiology and we are still at the stage where we try out a lot of things. And um, I mean, we have this uh, group of researchers we meet once a month since since the beginning of the pandemic, basically. And originally we thought we, we write a paper and help the standardization process, but actually we think there are still so many questions we also don't have the answer for, and it's just too early for standardization. I think once we figured out what works and what does not work, it would be great to have more standardization, but I think we're not at that point yet. Yeah. So do you want to say something, guys, besides? Uh, so, so that's alone on 
how we phrase questions and what scales that we are evaluating it on. But what I also found was that it's quite um, important to also discuss how we analyze this data. Uh, so the type of data that we get out from this is semi-continuous, it's also categorical, and what are the models that we use to actually model that data to see uh, differences between, for example, programs as I looked at in our study. And um, I also know that there are uh, groups that work on that to uh, implement packages um, where we can evaluate these uh, EMAs on. And I think in that sense, it's really important that we just put our heads together as you are already doing in this work group um, so that we can try and work towards standardizing these things. Because a lot of the questions that we are asking are actually really overlapping. Uh, so on people's... Um, yeah, hearing difficulty and uh, on uh, so the effort that people spend and their uh, intelligibility and all of these questions are kind of on the same scale and kind of the same wording. But yes, yeah, I think it's important yeah. that we yeah. that we try and move towards that. But uh, it is definitely early days mm. still. I, I agree. Uh, I think we're 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 long or far away from 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 a given standard to this. Uh, I think what you mentioned there, Josephine, about the questions that we're asking, that's, I guess, one of the main challenges, because uh, when we're asking to rate on a on a on a Likert scale or a visual analog scale to rate the multi-dimensional uh, uh, aspects or concepts, it's it's where we get a lot of noisy data, mm -hmm. and and uh, and. Unfortunately, it's it's very difficult to be able to to break that down into independent categories before we start uh, asking people, right? So we need to go through, iterate in many uh, with many uh, 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 experiments where we are able to gather data in, in in similar in a similar fashion, in order to see what what uh, what the data is is telling us. But uh, but I am uh, maybe. I'm a bit biased, by, but uh, I'm a, a strong advocate of trying to avoid scales. <laughs> yeah. Very, very much because of, of, of the ceiling effect you show and because we can never be sure that the interpretation of these scales are, are, are uniform. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do like scales for some quality assessment, but as generally when you have a clear uh, uh, best and, ba and, and worst, uh, uh, like a like a, a reference and an anchor, right? So you can you can you you are sure if your subjects are actually using the scale in the way they should be. Mm -hmm. With these more subjective and multi-dimensional uh, uh, concepts, trying to rate them in a single scale, I think is very very tricky. And and I'm not saying it's the wrong approach at the moment, but but it's it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a very it's it's trying to measure something that is in 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 a centimeter uh, uh, size uh, with a with a meter ruler. It's mm. it's a difficult task. We can get indications, but but uh, we need a lot of data, and we need to be able to 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 remove any confounders from the data in order to make any any reasonable conclusion. So. Mm. So that's that's one of the reasons, at least, uh, that in your research you show how important the the actual context where mm. these measurements were made uh, uh, shows up. I mean, if you don't have that information, then you're basically guessing what the people answer. So okay. so it's a it's a very very uh, strong component which you add with, by having these objective measures, trying to relate it to the subjective measures. The problem I see is that the subjective scale will probably have to be broken down into so many different aspects that it will end up being a questionnaire of, of let's say 50 questions. And, and that is completely impractical, in, impractical, uh, unpractical. Mm. Ah. Impractical. It's not possible in, in, a, in, a, in a decent uh, ecological momentary assessment because the idea of the, uh, uh, the momentary assessment is that it's something that is made with little effort quickly and, and, and very that you're assessing a small aspect of whatever experience you're having at that point, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to give a, a feedback in terms of, okay, this happened to me. Yes, no. Mm -hmm. or 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 a limited uh, answer capability yeah. so so not to sell my approach but the idea yeah. of that was to remove the scale right 
the problem is, is that we're bound to these experiences that we decided. So if these experiences are not part of what you're living or what you uh, perceive, then a lot of the the, the, the the material that we're presenting is going to be completely irrelevant for the mm -hmm. for the people. And that might have been one of the reasons why why we a lot of our subjects just answered a little bit in the beginning and then just dropped it because they didn't see the relevance of it. Right. So so in my point of view, being able to iterate over what experiences are valuable. So as when we start identifying the valuable experiences, then we can talk about those experiences. The, 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 uh, what is the frequency of occurrence of these experiences, both negative and positive, and then we can start building uh, uh, models to account for for uh, for uh, for the, the the general experience, or maybe related to a certain hearing uh, hearing loss type, or or type of hearing aid, or, or or a certain fitting rationale, and so forth. So mm. so, but but uh, but it is the approach we have, and is a good one so far. I mean, using the scales, but it's tricky. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, so we are already over time, but uh, we still have two questions. Might as well take it. Uh, hopefully, people will not uh, disappear. So, could machine learning be a suggestion to tackle this challenge? And what is the challenge? Uh, the EMA challenge, I would assume. Uh, in general, could uh, oh no, this is from Clement, and he did mention the dead regions, but I, I think maybe he means the. Uh, the, the EMA in general, could machine learning help somehow uh, in the EMA? Um, so it really depends on what the question is here. Um, but what we are trying is essentially to get rid of subjective reports. So I know we're talking about EMA and the power of EMA, but in reality, we are really trying to capture all these things from an objective point of view. And once we can do that, we will we want to build machine learning models that can predict certain preferences in a in a given situation that you can actually measure on the hearing aid. Um, currently, we actually have a project, and um, so Yoan, a PhD student here at uh, Airsolm, um, has built a machine learning model uh, based on the program changes that people make out in the field, and he's actually able to predict what program that people will update to based on nice. the context that they're in. So we are currently yep. using. I think that's more or less within the, the logic that is out here, right? Is that uh, going from one to the other, trying to make the bridge in between the two, right? Right. Cool. OK, so Rodrigo, you are already typing here, but I'm going to read the, the question anyway. Uh, how did you select the questions, experiences presented to the patients? Were you happy with the questions given that many patients are sort of high number of not experienced or not relevant response? Uh, well, to start with the first part of the question, the way we selected or, or, or came, came about these 564 uh, experiences was uh, through the, this, this contextual inquiry study we did where we observed both the, the assessment, the fitting, and the follow-up process in, in the clinics, uh, interviews with, uh, with uh, hearing care professionals and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, hearing aid uh, users, and as well uh, uh, from, from the existing questionnaires that we have for assessing a, a hearing aid benefit. So from all this information, we, we, we tried to devise or, or, or redact experiences that would reflect the given uh, points mentioned in the interviews or observed in the contextual inquiry. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, the lists uh, could be, uh, will probably change uh, if we iterate through the data we have and uh, if, if other people do the analysis. Uh, we also um, uh, should consider that that uh, they are they were chosen to be very broad so so inclusive of every type of hearing aid user i think that there are many for example which relate to uh, some experiences uh, that are related to people who are still working for example or uh, or experiences related to to people that uh, oh i didn't understand the priest in the church well if you don't go to the church then that's relevant for you or or tinnitus or or, or supporting structure and so forth so there, there are several issues there, 
uh, from the from the question uh, the questions that we or the experiences that we devised that can be optimized in the way of presenting them to the to the respondents. So uh, a suggestion could be that after a first iteration, you would remove all the ones that you uh, noted as as not uh, not relevant. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, we had that idea initially, but we were afraid that if we suddenly remove things at the beginning of the process, then they might become relevant later on in the process. Mm. We didn't know. We still don't know. So, so from the data set that we have now, we can we can start finding out which one of the experiences that we that we devised were were always deemed irrelevant. So we have a little bit of an idea of what we can remove. What is what is the clutter, so to speak. And and then we can begin to begin to to reiterate over the sentences. This is not a done deal, and I think that the, there's a lot more that can be do, can be done to 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 refine these sentences. Ideally, we should be down to some some a, a much smaller set of, of of experiences, so that that people are able to to actually answer several times about the same experience, so we can track. If there's an evolution or a change uh, during the the, the time they were, it really also years. depends on what you define as an experience. What is the important part of it? Because if it's um, the priest in the church, really, it's a person speaking in a reverberant room, right? So you don't necessarily have to sample every type of person speaking in reverberant room situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in in to that aspect, you're you're completely right. But to that aspect, one of the things that we strive for was to try to make these these experiences very relatable, right? Yeah. So so if you write uh, experience like oh I had problems uh, understanding speech in a reverberant room, yes. then 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 you completely annihilated everybody who didn't have a, 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 a degree in acoustics. So 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 the point the point is that that I of course the the, 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 a lot of people might know what reverberation is from an experience, not from the definition that we have as acousticians. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's the tricky part about having to ask people about the specific situation that you're doing in the type yeah. of questionnaire that you are exactly. providing with, right? Yeah, because th that's that's then the positive mm -hmm. part of having like a rating scale, and then we objectively measuring that acoustic context so that we can exactly. understand what their environment is in this situation. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah. Great, guys. Uh, we're, we're way over the time. So I think uh, this is a good time to say thank you very much to the three of you for this. Uh, it has been very, very informative. I hope people enjoyed it. And uh, I hope people also take, took the time to do the survey at the end, because uh, that way we can always make it better. And uh, this will, this is recorded, so it will be online for people to watch it again and again. And we will also share uh, the, the, some of your information and, and, and the slides uh, okay. if you can. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, see thank you. Thank you uh, for the invitation. And uh, thank you, Nadia and Rodrigo, as well. It was super informative uh, yeah. for me to hear your thank you. Well. Yeah, and stay Thank in touch. You this is always uh, one of the good things about it as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.